Let me give uh, an introduction. Uh, you guys all know me as D. Schiff. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Seth Andrews, to Believers vs. Non-Believers, the largest live international religious debate and discussion platform uh, on the web. Uh, Seth is a former Christian broadcaster and now an advocate for reason and a prominent figure in the atheist community. Um, he produces videos, radio po podcasts, and he blogs for his website, The Thinking Atheist, known as The Thinking Atheist. His YouTube channel has over 200,000 subscribers, 26 million views, and his weekly radio podcast um, is downloaded a million times a month. Uh, for those of you familiar with Seth's writing, you know his writing is insightful, relatable, um, often humorous, um, touches on policy, politics, interfaith social issues, psychology, reason, rationality, philosophy, ethics, apologetics, uh, and more. Um, Seth published his first book on his own deconversion, entitled Deconversion, A Journey from Religion to Reason, and his second book is coming out next month, I believe uh, discussing comparative religion around the world. Uh, it is entitled Sacred Cows, A Lighthearted Look at Belief in Tradition, and I think we might get a sneak preview of that this evening. Uh, just as a heads up, I believe uh, Seth is recording the conversation tonight for his podcast, so let's show him respect and aim for a constructive and polite environment. Uh, regarding format, I, I think Seth is going to start off just by speaking about the topic in the little room banner um, right below the, the space in the top of the room, and then perhaps we'll be open to some Q&A. Uh, we're really glad to have you here, Seth, and with that, I will turn the microphone over to you. I always enjoy watching the uh, chat rooms because when people are typing, and maybe myself included, and you feel a measure of sort of protection behind the computer monitor, you say things and you act often act in a way that you would not do when you are standing right next to somebody or you're talking over coffee or something like that. So, you know, and you're on the, the YouTube comment section, if I make a, a statement or uh, especially if I make a mistake, or if uh, somebody sees something posted they don't like or don't uh, agree with, you know, they just unleash, they go crazy, they just become, uh, you know, just incensed, and it becomes this long tirade. And, you know, if we were just talking over coffee, they'd be like, you know, I didn't really much care for that. So how you been? <laughs> you know, and uh, I was talking to the guys at the Cognitive Dissonance Radio podcast, and it's, uh, was it uh, Tom or Cecil who said something like, it's almost like you're behind the wheel of an SUV. You know, you feel invincible. If somebody cuts you off and you're walking on a sidewalk, you're like, oh, God, you know, you're kind of an a-hole. Um, if you somebody cuts you off in traffic on the highway and you're barreling down in a big tank, you know, you, you're like, you're honking the horn, you're swerving, you're carrying on, you conduct yourself a little bit differently than you might if you were just hanging out. So, And I'm guilty of it as well. I think the... Uh, the internet sort of changes the temperature of some dialogue. So as I pop in, I'm already seeing shit about me. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, uh, hey, welcome to the internet, people, you know, and I'm totally fair game. So knock yourself out. When we do the Q&A, just let me have it. If there's a, something you want to say, don't filter it on my behalf. Just say what's on your mind. Somebody in the chat room accused me of shilling for my book, which I will cop to. Uh, the truth is I'm here because I was invited to be here. I'm here because I'm a radio host. I'm a communicator by trade. I am. I think I've got a dog in this fight coming from fundamentalist Christianity and walking away from it after a dozen years in Christian radio and, you know, sort of ministering, not as a pastor, but as somebody who was in a public position ministering the gospel. And I was a true believer, and I live in a community and culture where some things are sacred, you know, you, some things are not to be challenged. Quite often it's couched like this. You know, who are you to question the Almighty God? And what authority do you have to challenge God, Jesus, Yahweh, Allah, whoever? And I'm always sort of fascinated by that mentality. The, um, the idea that I will automatically opt out. You know, I'm not going to ask the question because I don't have the authority because this is off limits, this is protected. Meanwhile, if I'm a religious person about Deity X over here, I have used some measure of criteria to talk about all of the other deities over here, the ones I disagree with, because if you go to a Christian and you talk about Islam, they're like, oh no, that's a false faith. If you go to Islam, you talk about Christianity or you talk about Catholicism or Hinduism, or all oh, those are false faiths. Well, obviously they're using a measure of criteria. They are engaging with some standard, 
by which their belief system is measured. And they have made a judgment, right? They've made a judgment call and said, I believe this over this. And so the idea that we don't have the authority to judge is just crap. It's just a lousy and lazy argument. And I think it's a way for people to protect themselves from any real criticism. When I was a believer, I thought, you know, who, who should, who has the authority to question God? It was my way of kind of insulating myself and making sure that I'm never going to really live my life challenged in any way. And there were some things that were hugely sacred. We didn't ever mock or lampoon God or Jesus or any of the major characters in the Bible, from Adam to Abraham to Moses to whoever. When biblical movies would come out, even uh, uh, was it Mel Brooks's The History of the World, where Moses comes off the mountain with 15 commandments and he drops one of the tablets and he's like, 10, 10 commandments. Oh, we're not allowed to laugh at that, you know. Um, whenever Monty Python's The Life of Brian came out, there were protests in front of the theater. The churches were boycotting and picketing and carrying on. You know, this is sacrilege because the scriptures are sacred. Anything having to do with Jesus, including the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, they were off limits. And we were made to feel really nervous and really scared about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, because that is, according to Scripture, the one unforgivable sin. It's the most sacred thing, right? Which is stupid when you stop and think about it. God isn't offended by the rape of a child. That's not the unforgivable sin. You know, God's not going to make the genocide of the Jews during the Holocaust the unforgivable sin. God's not going to make all of these heinous crimes that have done against people. He's not going to make that the unforgivable sin. He's going to make, oh, you hurt my feelings, the unforgivable sin. And if he's truly omnipotent, how can you hurt his feelings? How can he genuinely be wounded by somebody who would say something against the spirit? And people would always warn you, be careful, be careful, you know, go easy, don't. Now talk about sacred. You know, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you cannot be forgiven. Why can't I be forgiven? You know, what, what's that about? And fear is a powerful mechanism when you're in the church and they don't want you to leave the church. Fear keeps you on the straight and narrow. Fear of hell, fear of being ostracized in your community, uh, fear of, uh, of getting it wrong, you know, fear of some kind of punishment here on earth, even if it's not hell. God can jack your life up, you know, he can ruin your family, you can lose your job, you can be financially destitute, God can jack you up, so be careful, and don't touch anything that's sacred. And so I have a book that's releasing here in the next uh, few weeks, I'm hoping in June, perhaps July, called Sacred Cows, A Lighthearted Look at Belief and Tradition Around the World. And the book pinballs around different cultures and belief systems and and faith traditions and cultural traditions, even those not necessarily having to do with religion, and looks at them from the perspective of, hey, you know, is this, is this, you know, something that is, is genuinely sacred? Does it deserve protection? And it's some of the stuff is nuts, you know, like in Spain when they feel like that. In order to have prosperity in the community in the town, every year they drag a live goat up to the top of the belfry and they chuck the goat off the roof and catch it in a sheet. Sometimes the goat doesn't even live, you know. And then they have to parade the goat through town because only then can good fortune be brought to the tribe. In Bulgaria, there's a tremendously offensive ritual they do called trechin, where they honestly believe that they have to ward off evil spirits and uh, things like rabies and, and to promote fertility and prosperity. They have to take a dog and people bring their pet dogs out and they tie a rope around its waist and they sort of suspend it over a river and they turn the rope. They just twist it so that the dogs sort of continues to get tightened and tightened and tightened and tightened up into the rope until finally the rope can be tightened no more. And then they release the rope and the dog spins for an eternal 15 to 20 seconds before finally disconnecting and splashing into the river. Some of the dogs so disoriented that they drown, okay? 
And of course, when animal rights activists heard about this nonsense, they just went crazy. And I think it was banned for a period of time, but it has been, as I understand it, reinstated because the mayor says this is an important tradition. People don't realize how important it is for us to be able to practice this sacred tradition for the benefit of the village and the community. I mean, who thought this up, right? You know, our corn crop has been rather pithy this season. Bring me a rope and a puppy. Is essentially what they're saying. It's just nonsense. But because of them, in their mind, it's sacred. Because in their mind, it's sacred. They don't challenge it. They do it, even if it's insane, even if it's, you know, nonsensical and cruel and terrible. There's a ritual. Where was it? I'm trying to remember. I'm not going to, obviously, I'm not going to read the whole book to you here. There's, the book has uh, 19 full chapters of uh, a lot of different types of tradition. And, and I cover, and shameless plug, I cover everything from Jediism to the Church of Scientology. We talk about the Church of Satan. We get into the, the selection of the Pope, which is, talk about a sacred icon. You know, if you go and you start to talk about the Pope, some people flip out. I'll tell you, and this isn't in the book, but it's in a speech that I'm giving around the country called I Love the Idea. And it, it has to do with Mother Teresa. I tell you, you go and, and challenge the, um, the purity, the integrity, the sainthood of Mother Teresa, and people flip out. They, it's like you've insulted one of their children or their mother, which psychologically speaking is actually sort of what's happening. Mother Teresa functions as kind of a maternal figure in their life. I was talking to Dr. Andy Thompson about it, and he had a great line, you know, talking about how, yeah, you've essentially insulted their grandmother, and they get pissed off. But if you ask the people who are defending Mother Teresa, or even the Pope, the people who are so indignant and so freaky and so just incensed that you would, you would have the gall, the arrogance, the nerve, who do you think you are? Ask them, give me three facts about Mother Teresa that don't have to do with her religion or the fact that she's a, you know, a nun, or the fact that, um, or, or the city she was born in, all right? So outside of anything like that, give me three facts about Mother Teresa that you know. How much do you know about this woman that you are so vehemently defending? And you see this, you know, this deafening silence. Well, she's, um, she's a nun. No, no, I can't use that one. She's Catholic. No, she helps poor people. All right, she helps poor people. Wonderful. In what specific way does she help poor people? Give me some specific things that she has done, some causes she's been involved with, some churches or organizations that she has built that serve poor people. Give me some specific examples, would you? Well, I, they, I, you know, I've seen she, there's pictures, right? There's pictures of her. She's got uh, poor children in her arms. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and they don't know a thing. They fell in love with the idea of the sainthood of someone like Mother Teresa. They don't know a damn thing about her. And yet she's considered sacred and off limits. And I find this fascinating. And so uh, sort of the idea behind the writing of the book is, are there any sacred cows? Is there any, anything out there? Is there anything out there that's genuinely off limits? that you can't touch, that, that you can't challenge, that you aren't worthy or credible enough or have the authority to challenge and, and criticize. And I find that a very interesting subject. And uh, for my part, I just don't think there are any sacred cows. I think, uh, you know, people get respect. Yeah, great. Ideas, they don't get respect. Ideas are not guaranteed respect. You don't get to walk in and make a, a claim, even a cherished claim without evidence, and automatically get respect simply because that idea is cherished, because it's important to you, because it makes you feel good, because you've always done it that way, because you're afraid of challenging it. I don't have to abide by those rules. You are not off limits. If you're going to make a claim, if you're going to bring a sacred, quote unquote, sacred icon into the arena of ideas, you had better prepare yourself because we are going to examine it. And we're going to do so without fear. And that is a liberating place, you know, when you're not worried about the unforgivable sin. You're not worried about God sending you to hell for having the audacity to ask questions, but you walk in and say, actually, bring it. You know, you're the one making the claim. Why don't you put something behind it? Otherwise, get out of here. You know, 
I operate from the null position, as my buddy Matt Delahunty likes to say. It's like you're being in a courtroom. If you're going to come in and make a positive claim, then you're going to have to prove the claim, whether it's a God claim or something else. I don't start at the, the default position of godhood or sainthood or credibility for you know, some, some wild claim. I say, all right, cool. Uh, I'd like you to present the evidence. I'm going to check it out and we'll make a judgment. And we have the right to make a judgment as to whether or not the evidence does support it. And uh, from that perspective, no, I personally don't think there are any sacred cows, but I would be curious to see what the folks in the uh, chat room here have to say about it. So that's my shtick. Essentially, I crawled out of Christianity. Now I'm an atheist activist, and I, I, know I go around the country and even around the world stirring the pot and, uh, and mostly encouraging people. I always like to say, I, I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm saying that... It's okay to ask the questions. And I'm amazed at how often this is not the case. People are terrified or they're ostracized for having the gall to ask the questions. No, it's okay. We don't necessarily have the answers, but it's okay to ask the questions. And I think that would probably be one of the biggest messages I would want to leave with everybody in the chat room today. So I'm at your disposal. If anybody has a comment or question, just let me know. Okay, you said you operate from the null position. Uh, I just take a little problem with that. We have courtrooms and everybody has agreed upon that we should have a presumption of innocence. You're saying that we should take that way of reasoning to how we assess claims about the nature of reality, such as whether or not God exists or even empirical claims. I would hold that we shouldn't take that approach. There isn't any good reason why we should take that approach. Now, you're saying that you operate from that uh, standpoint. Now, is there a good reason why you hold this presumption that something should be a de demonstrable before whether or not you disbelieve or believe it? Um, because I hold the position of agnosticism, that is to say that if I don't have good reasons to believe or disbelieve something, then I should res reserve judgment on whether or not it's true or false. So I'm just a little curious to why you hold that position, because that's a little striking to me. My trick. Well, I don't think it's presumptuous at all to say, prove it. If you're going to walk in and make a claim, why would it be presumptuous to say, show me the evidence for said claim? And you may be a little confused about what atheism and agnosticism is. You know, atheism speaks to what I believe. Agnosticism speaks to what I know. And, you know, I can't prove a God somewhere doesn't exist. You know, I can't prove that there's not a giant plush pink spider monkey on the outer membrane of the universe. You know, I, I can't prove that that is the case. It is not likely. I certainly haven't seen any evidence to say that there is. But um, I don't believe in a God because I haven't seen any evidence that demonstrates that there is a God. No supernatural activity. We live in a natural world governed by natural laws. I've seen religious claims, specific religious claims can be addressed and discounted. I disbelieve outright in the God of Christianity, a specific God with a proper name, who's, uh, you know, who does specific things in a book that has long been debunked. I disbelieve in the God of the Quran. I disbelieve in all the gods of, of Hinduism because there's simply no evidence to support them or evidence that they did not exist or could not exist. But, you know, Atheism means I do not believe in God. It doesn't say I make the declaration that there is no God, period. I don't have a position at all. Let's test the waters. Let's see what that's about. If Jesus shows up tomorrow, let's figure that out. But until then, no, I hold the atheist and the agnostic position. Mike's free. Hey there, Seth. Thank you for coming to speak. Um, so I'm thinking that with many people who will ask you questions, uh, many people in the mic QIC are atheists, so we are uh, all extremely close to your position. So I'm, I'm going to ask you some things which are to do with grounding knowledge rather than <clears throat> refutations of, uh, of God or, or otherwise. Um, when we talk about claims which require uh, proving and claims which require evidence and claims which require supporting, two that I'd be interested just to get your take on and, and how it is that you, that, that, you, that you ground them outside of the null hypothesis, how, how do you ground the laws of logic? 
Um, how do you account for those? What do you ground those as? as I'm sure you know, many theists attempt to ground them in the nature of God and his, his transcendent ordination. So um, how is it that you, that you account for logic? Do you assume logic? Do you have, have evidence for logic, I, I suppose? And um, likewise, uh, morality. Uh, I, I suppose that without a God, you don't consider that you live in a complete moral vacuum. Uh, this is a common charge leveled by the religious. How is it that you account for morality? How is it that you traverse uh, good and bad? How do you, how do you make that uh, uh, delineation? Uh, do you do it purely according to, to, to suffering? Um, and if that's the case, you know, as many atheists I've heard do, suffering versus flourishing. Uh, and if so, how do you account for suffering being bad? Uh, so yeah, these, these I'm, I'm obviously extremely close to your own position as an agnostic atheist, but I'm just asking you questions more out of interest to get your take. So how do you ground logic and, and uh, what is your position relative to morality? How would you ground both? Free mic. I remember uh, when uh, Matt was having his debate with Cy Tim Bruken came to Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, Sai is one of the precept apologists, like many who holds to the objective moral standard, objective standards for logic and whatnot. And, and the only reason we could know something was logical was if an objective standard existed. The only reason we would know rape is wrong and murder is wrong is if we had an objective standard, which obviously had to be put in place by a standard bearer, that kind of thing. You know, I'm I'm not as much of a philosopher as a lot of the, the people out there when it comes to uh, to logic. I, you know, I, I obviously read some David Hume, but I'm not uh, I'm not an expert in logic. All I know is that I operate in the reality around me, and without evidence that there is another reality, then I simply operate as best I can within the reality reality that is here. You know, whether we can. We can test, we can experiment, we can replicate, duplicate the results of those tests. You know, I can't, you know, we are, the running gag is, how can you prove you're not a, a brain in a vat? Well, you know, I, I may not be able to prove I'm not a brain in a vat. Um, but I operate as, as best I can within the reality around me, within the rea reality that I perceive. And this is to the best of my understanding, the best of my knowledge, the only reality that there is. And it's just the best I've got. You know, you can come up with wild scenarios about who put a standard in place for things like logic and morality, but it doesn't really make them true. It just means somebody posited them, you know? I mean, I think if you look at things like morality from an evolutionary, from a tribalistic perspective, it makes a lot of sense. You know, what's frightening is the idea that we would require a, an invisible eye in the sky to tell us that murder is wrong, that rape is wrong, that, that theft and, and abuse and, and slavery and all these things are wrong. If you look at the history of humankind and you see what morality does for the individual and the tribe, you begin to see that what benefits the other does benefit me from the evolutionary point of view. You know, the idea that we would all just be, uh, you know, would be like a little F5 tornado, just be going around, just doing anything and everything we wanted without pause, without reason. It would just be anarchy and craziness and just nonstop, uh, um, sort of a, a, a nonstop, um, sort of a, I'm trying to think of the word, but it would be a pattern of destruction because we were just without guidelines. And I just don't buy that. I think what benefits the other does benefit the tribe. I think we were better in numbers and acting morally toward each other actually was better for us. It benefited us. And then we came to a point from an evolutionary standpoint where altruistic behavior began to make us feel good. Doing something for someone else without necessarily getting a reward back still gave us that benefit, that good feeling. And so I, uh, that's where I operate from. I think that uh, morality can be you know, you can see instances of morality and immorality in throughout nature. You can see it in and throughout humanity, but also the animal kingdom. You don't need a deity. You certainly don't need a deity with a proper name, which is really the point here. When somebody says the objective moral standard, they are, they're pitching Jesus usually with a capital J. And that's just a big leap. You know, the idea that it's, it's a, what, Jesus is the guy who, who fathered himself through a teenage girl so he could have himself ritually tortured and executed to save us from the hell that he created and a book written by anonymous primitives. Uh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, I, mean, that, I think we have to go back. And, but in the, larger, in the larger point of view, I think we just have to 
operate as best we can within the reality that we perceive and can test around us. We experiment, we look at the results, we replicate the results and do the best we can with what we have. But I don't think this gives any credence or credibility to anybody who's positioning a third party, an eye in the sky, especially one with a proper name. Mike is. Yeah, can I be heard? Uh, can I just get a one before I, okay, awesome. Yeah, um, hey, um, I've listened to your um, stuff on YouTube a number of times, uh, probably listened to like half a dozen or so episodes and I got a real kick out of them. Probably my favorite one is uh, the Cy Ten Bergen Kate one. <laughs> But anyhow, um, I'd like to get your take on this. Um, what your views are on the recent happenings in Texas with that, um, I believe it was a Draw Muhammad um, contest or something where they uh, gunned down like two terrorists. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting thing. So we've kind of been um, debating and arguing about it back and forth here uh, in the days following that thing. Uh, so I'll just give you my view, and then I wanted to kind of get your take. Uh, I disagree that allowing people the freedom to um, express not only their lack for a view uh, or an ideology uh, can equal inciting hatred, right? Like, you know, we don't need to respect any particular idea or ideology, neither. Um, but even if we display, like, a disgust for it or something, I don't think that equals inciting hatred either. Uh, like, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in America, I mean, you can burn the president in effigy, right? I mean, you can burn the American flag, right? I don't think that's, you know, I mean, somebody might, you know, want to, like, grab a gun and go shoot somebody for doing that, but I don't think that's inciting hatred. And I think, um, you know, another way I would support that is to say that any country that supports the sort of freedom of expression, um, you know, is demonstrating a great virtue of that country, right? I mean, I think that's advertising like, look, we tolerate dissension. I think, you know, there's that Thomas Jefferson quote or something that dissension is the greatest form of patriotism. So imagine how, you know, a former Muslim would feel, right, where they can finally, you know, speak out about just how disgusted they are at, um, you know, Islam or something like that and be allowed that sort of freedom where, you know, the peer pressure in many places in Islam is to not even question, right? So imagine, you know, the contrast between America that, you know, um, um, you know, promotes that kind of thing versus, you know, some fundamentalist Islamic state. I think that's a great virtue of a place like America. I was reminded of uh, what the Pope had said just a few months ago after the uh, Charlie Hebdo massacre, you know, and he said, you can't insult the faith of others. You know, he condemns the attack, but then he comes back and he says, you can't insult, you know, you just can't do that. And I think to myself, yeah, you can. And um, it's funny that I've, I've got a big family and um, there is, uh, there's somebody on our family tree, he's a young guy, you know, he's full of beans and, and he was talking about how he got so mad at somebody sometime he felt like he was going to punch a wall or something. He, he, they almost had me. They almost had me to the point where I was going to, I was just going to go off and I was going to start doing this, some some damage. Right? He's a big man. You big man, that kind of thing. And I looked at him. I said, Well, actually, if you lose your temper and you start punching walls and breaking things, the problem isn't them. The problem is you. <laughs> the problem is your your lack of self control. They're not they're not ramming your fists against the sheetrock. You are. I produced a video a few years ago called Jesus the Revenge, and it was me lampooning the Jesus story. If, what if Jesus had been crucified? And he'd come back, and instead of forgiving humankind, he had, he just came back guns blazing. You know, he comes out of the tomb, he's got Uzis, you know, there's there's smoke and a hail of gunfire and flame. He's got a flamethrower, and the rock soundtrack goes crazy, and it's like, you know, Jesus, the revenge, that kind of thing. And I posted this hugely blasphemous video about Jesus Christ. And the worst I got was, oh, you shouldn't do that, I'm going to pray for you. All right? Now, you do the same thing about Muhammad, 
and you worry about somebody showing up at your house with a machete, right? But what does that say to people who are so threatened by this idea? Well, what does that say about the huge insecurity they have about their own deity? He's supposed to be, a, right? Allah is supposedly a god and Muhammad is prophet. So even on its surface, they don't need you to defend them. They don't need you to go and do battle against the infidel. They don't need you to go and wail and scream and carry on and riot in the streets and carry on. The truth is, they're gods and a prophet. They don't require you for really anything. So what you're doing is, number one, you're betraying a huge insecurity about your own deity and your own faith. And two, you are revealing that you simply are not in control of your own faculties when it comes to ideas and being disagreed with. These are people, in many cases, who simply cannot stand the idea of being disagreed with. And in that context, I think satire is hugely important. There are no sacred cows, right? I mean, you should be able to lampoon any character anywhere, a political, a religious character, any character, any person is fair game, even if it's in bad taste, even if it's loathsome, it still needs to be protected speech. And if somebody loses their shit over it, it says more about them than it ever said about you. It essentially says they can't control themselves. They don't have a, a barometer. They just, their immediate thing is just to go nuts. And uh, I think that, uh, that satire in that way, you know, I support the Draw Muhammad campaign. I support the, um, the ability to do satirical things to sacred icons. Because the truth is, is if they are truly holy supernatural entities, they can take care of themselves and they don't need their followers on earth, these clumsy insects, these mortal beings, they don't need their followers on earth to go and do battle on their behalf. They're already the biggest kid on the playground. I hope that answers your question. Mike is free. Seth, first of all, let me say thank you so much for coming to the room. I am enjoying uh, this conversation immensely. Now, I, I have to get this in quick. I don't, I don't want to be labor time, but I, I have three things I want to toss at you. Um, was your uh, abandonment of religion an epiphany? Was it, was it quick? Did it happen in one day, or was it a gradual process? I'd be curious about that. And your name. You say you're from a big family. So are you the third child of, and was your mother named Eve? Uh, and lastly, uh, why doesn't anyone pray for Satan? I've answered the question so many times that it's, I fear that I bore people sometimes because they know my story so well. But the truth is, there were two major events in my life that caused me to begin questioning, that kind of rattled my cages. And uh, there were a lot of small events. Uh, the first was in 97. It was the death of a Christian artist named Rich Mullins. I was charged to go on the radio and inform the radio audience that his terrible, horrible death in a car wreck was somehow God's will. The event of 9-11, I was charged to pray for everyone. I was working for Clear Channel Radio at the time, and I was known as the Christian, right? I was the Christian on staff. I was Mr. Clean, and the buildings are burning, and everybody comes into me because they think I'm the guy to pray for them. And the whole time, I'm like, wait a minute. Why are we praying for protection? You know, this is just nuts. I mean, if God had really been interested in, in uh, preventing 9-11, he could have locked everybody in a traffic jam and save the day. He could have invalidated some passports. He could have done anything. And the truth is, God, had he existed, wasn't interested. And then I saw all the people who were co-opting the event for their own agendas, the Pat Robertsons of the day, talking about it because it's homosexuality and it's the end times and God's judging America because we turned our back on them, all that kind of crap. <laughs> I thought, come on, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And then a bunch of small ones. And finally, you know, in my upper 30s, I got smart and decided I was going to read the Bible objectively for myself. 
you know, hey, instead of having it preached to me or cherry picking all the happy clappy verses out of Corinthians and Romans, John 3.16, why don't I go and start reading the freaking Bible for myself? Well, you know, when you do that without your God glasses on, you can really learn a lot. And the things you learn are quite alarming. And uh, I finally began to see the dominoes start to fall. Before I knew it, I, by the time I was uh, was late 2008, I said the word atheist out loud in, in regard to myself. And my family's just horrified. I mean, they're, they're hardcore believers. They're praying for my eternal soul every freaking day. Uh, every time we get to, at a family get-together, they always drop at least one line about the book of Revelation come to pass. And did you see the news about Israel? And, and God's so good that he saved so-and-so in a car wreck. They only had minor bruises and a broken bone instead of dying. Praise the Lord. By the way, it was a physician. Paramedics rushed him to the hospital and a doctor put him back together. Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff. And I began to re research, uh, you know, the historicity of other religions. And, you know, it's funny because um, the more you look at other religions, <laughs> the more you realize that most major religions are doing an interpretive dance to the same tune. They have a deity, they have a prophet, they have a holy book, they have a coda, a doctrine, they have a paradise, they have a pain. You know what I'm saying? It's, it, it's like Mexican food. All of the dishes on the menu are made with pretty much the exact same ingredients. They're just serving them up slightly differently. As far as why people don't pray for Satan, I don't have the first clue. I have no idea. I think they maybe see Satan as just too far gone. I want to know why Satan was created to begin with. If you believe in Yahweh, you believe in Jesus, you believe in Satan and the Holy Bible. Somebody answer me why God created Lucifer in the first place. Yahweh being omniscient, he already knew Lucifer was going to become a bad apple and screw up the party. Why did he create Lucifer anyway? Then once Lucifer was created and he had his hugely impressionable children in the Garden of Eden, why did he allow Lucifer or the serpent, Lucifer's sort of uh, uh, ambassador, to kind of sneak around and whisper in their ear? Why after the rapture, when the second coming happens, is Jesus going to give dominion over the planet to Lucifer for seven years. If it's just ludicrous, the more you think about it. I mean, Satan is God's fault. <laughs> even says in Isaiah that God created evil. Yahweh, evil exists because God created it. So everything that's happening in the world that they think is the devil's fault is actually Yahweh's fault. And when you see it from that perspective, it is truly enlightening. Mike is free. Uh, hello, Seth. Welcome to the room. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I've already had a chance to look at your book. It looks really fun, and I find what you're saying really fascinating, especially the part that you have converted from Christian uh, to a secular individual, um, but that you're still basically doing something similar professionally. Um, I'm somebody here on Pal Talk that utilizes humor and parody, I think, a fair amount. Probably people in the room would agree with that. Um, and I think that that's very good. Um, especially in appealing to other secular people to solidify and to clarify uh, what we think is rational and what we think is not rational. On the other hand, though, I don't know if it's the best method for trying to reach out to people who are, you know, very fundamentalist or very religious. They tend to just kind of be taken aback by it. Sometimes I think it's very cathartic for secular people. Um, but again, I, I wonder um, how effective it is. So it looks like that your book in a way that the... the the tact of it or, or the position of it is more to appeal to the secular base, which is fine and fascinating. And it looks like your book covers many different topics, which I'm sure are very interesting. But I wonder if in a way, um, as we continue to skewer um, people like you who are, I guess, in a way, professional um, secularists or atheists or however you want to put it, um, at some point in the atheist community, um, do we move away uh, from simply skewering. Um, it, it, it is the problem, I guess what I'm trying to say, is that people will have irrational beliefs. We know that they will continue to have irrational beliefs. Um, so is Shelley, a liberal girl, let's say, who lives in Arkansas, has gay friends and thinks that women should be able to control their own bodies, but believes that Jesus died for her so that she could sleep at night without having nightmares of her dead parents, isn't it time to reach out to people like that politically to create a better society? Or do we just keep skewering people like this together until they simply ignore us forever? I yield the mic. Well, I think that um, 
lampooning sacred ideas has its place, but I don't think that place is necessarily to convince other people. I think it has a purpose, but if I'm going out to try to, to change a mind, if I'm speaking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, I don't send them the Jesus, the revenge video, okay? That's not my tactic. But I think that lampooning sacred ideas is important. And they've been important in my own life because they've helped sort of liberate me from the chains of fear that I once had over these things. It's liberating to be able to, to take all these supposedly untouchable, insulated ideas, the things that you weren't allowed to ever lampoon or mock, and to actually mock them and to say, you know what, you have no more power over me. Uh, I'm, I'm, you don't control me anymore. You know, I now live in a different world. I live in a better world. And so when I lampoon, I normally do it just sort of a, as a demonstration that, you know, these things no longer control me and a reminder to others who are going through the same journey that they don't have to control them either. Now, Sacred Cows does lampoon quite a few religious beliefs. The interesting part about Sacred Cows, and this is purposeful, is that if a Protestant Christian picks up the book, and I'm guessing if anybody religious picks it up, they're going to be Christian or Catholic largely because of the demographic we have here in the United States. Well, they're going to start off reading about the snake handlers of the Appalachian Mountains. You know, they're going to read about the Church of Scientology. They're going to read about uh, the Dudist priest, if you're a fan of the Big Lebowski. You know, they're going to read about um, magic Mormon underwear and and the origins of the Mormon faith, you know, Joseph Smith and the Book of Gold Plates and the, the Angels Mormon and Moroni and those types of things. And so what they're doing is they already think those things are ridiculous. So they're taking the ride with me. Oh, yeah, that's nuts. Look at these guys down in uh, the first church of the what's happening now who grab live rattlesnakes from under the rocks and drag them into church services. And then they get bitten, refuse medical care, have the nerve to act surprised when they die or somebody dies over it, you know. Um, they are taking that journey with me. When we talk about, uh, you know, the worship of, well, not really worship of cows, but uh, some there's a deity, like a, a wish cow in Hinduism a cow that can be prayed to that might provide wishes among the thousands of gods posited by Hinduism. They're like, oh, geez, that's just so insane. Uh, they, they hear about, um, I'm trying to think of another example off the top of my head, but you get the idea. I mean, we're pinballing around talking about some more fringe type things, but subtly, and then sometimes not so subtly, I am actually tying that into, well, you know, Actually, the Christianity origin story isn't all that crazy compared to the, the origin story of the Bible, of humankind, and how the Bible was written and where Jesus came from, right? The Joseph Smith story isn't all that nuts when you look at it against many of the basic teachings of mainstream Christianity. And that's purposeful. And so what we're doing is we're actually having a good time kind of poking a finger at some of the more wild, crazy stuff that people don't necessarily know a lot about. And then before you know it, they're like, oh, yeah, actually, you know, that uh, a, a space wizard created a dirt man and a rib woman in a garden with talking animals. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, they may not even admit it to themselves, but that's kind of my end zone. Now, if we're just having discussions with people, I'm a big fan of the Socratic method. I'm a big fan of using questions. Dr. Peter bogosian has got an amazing book called The Manual for Creating Atheist. I think it is almost indispensable because it allows you to get into these discussions without beating somebody over the head, without making fun of them, without uh, being caustic or toxic, but simply using queries and questions about basic parts of their faith and getting them to a point, and they will get frustrated and they will begin to shut down and they will have issues with it, but you're not clubbing them over the head with it. And then when the lights are off and they are off far away, they are probably almost certainly still thinking about and wrestling with the questions that you ask. And because they were questions, ask with a, a good heart and good intentions, right? You're not being snide, you're not being a jerk about it, but you're genuinely asking questions. Look, can you tell me about this? 
can you tell me, I mean, how could someone live inside a submerged fish for 72 hours? I mean, do you really think that, that, is, that that's possible? You know, how did Balaam's donkey actually speak to him? I mean, that, that's some kind of an, do you really believe that animals could talk? If an animal spoke to you today, do you, would you believe it? What if God came to you like he came to Abraham and he asked you to sacrifice one of your kids as a gesture of obedience? You know, would you, would you, I mean, would you drive a dagger into the heart of your child? I mean, if God really asked you, because he's done it before, there's a precedent set. And we really admire Abraham as a man of obedience, a good godly man. Would you do that? Would you be as godly as Abraham? And which child would you choose? Right? You're asking questions. They're not necessarily easy questions, but they are questions, and they get people to a point where they are really starting to have to, to qualify and quantify and answer and explain and answer for all the stuff that they have positioned as fact and truth. And I'm convinced, sometimes it takes weeks, months, even years. Gee, it might even take decades, but I am convinced that those questions were like seeds, and they continue to grow and, and expand, and, and they begin to impact thinking. I'm not saying you're going to rush off and become atheist, but they will probably, if nothing else, begin to moderate their own fundamentalist position on many of these things. And the more moderate they are, well, the less of a threat they are out there in the arena of ideas. Mike is free. Hi, Seth. Uh, every time Bill Maher uh, says something about Islam, all the bloggers and all the journalists come out and start vilifying him and saying that you shouldn't disrespect Islam, you're not going to change anything. And they start using this term, new atheist. Well, I've been an atheist since I started ditching catechism 50 years ago. And I hardly consider myself a new atheist. So what's your take on that term and these people that are continually vilifying uh, Bill Maher and uh, Sam Harris? Mike is open. I'm looking on the uh, chat room. Somebody's upset that... Others are waiting on the mic. Well, you know, I'm kind of a blabbermouth, I guess, and I like to thoroughly explore ideas. So, I mean, I'll stick with you guys for a while tonight. I don't think we're in a huge hurry, but I'm not going to rush through an answer if I genuinely have something to say, okay? Um, I don't really get new atheists because the ideas being presented are really not all that new. The same ideas being presented by Bertrand Russell, and Robert Green Ingersoll, and so many others. But I think people like to label things. And I also think if you are not an atheist, it's a way of, or you are, you consider yourself more progressive than an atheist in some way. You're more enlightened in some way. I think it's a way of, of stamping a label on someone and in a way discounting them. Oh, he's one of the new atheists. Well, I mean, what is that? You know, you can talk about the brand, you can talk about the label, or we can explore the ideas that are being discussed. And I think that's the distraction. Now, stop talking about the moniker somebody stuck on my forehead, you know, on a magazine. Just bam, there he is. Hey, Seth's a new atheist. So-and-so is a new atheist. Let's talk about the questions and the comments and the challenges I and others like me bring to the table. Let's have a discussion about those ideas. Maybe it's a way of attacking the messenger. I don't really know. Mike is free. Seth, I'm going to quick, quickly ask you two questions, uh, but please uh, only answer one since there are lots of people uh, waiting. So just you, you mentioned the new atheists. I would be interested to know your views <clears throat> relative to free will, uh, which seems to be a topic that divides atheists. So since we're mostly all atheists here, I'm just interested to hear you speak upon issues that are, you know, perhaps contentious or perhaps about which there is. Uh, healthy disagreement within uh, within atheist circles. Uh, how do you? Uh, what's your reaction to Sam Harris's uh, theories? In so much as you're aware of them, uh, that we have no free will, uh, and how does that uh, square with your views of atheism? Uh, the other thing uh, was actually prompted by I hadn't realized that your deconversion was quite so recent, and uh, it's a while ago, a long while ago since I was Christian, and I <clears throat> must say that I don't. It was actually in my childhood. I don't actually have ready access anymore to the thinking processes that kept me Christian. But when uh, I hear you speak and you say it's just so obvious that Christianity is nonsense and these things are hopelessly contradicting, and you know who could ever believe and so on. Um, 
you know, you recently did, and I, I'm assuming by your tale fairly devoutly, do you have any recall of what it is that actually kept you, um, you know, kept you Christian, uh, perhaps kept you from thinking critically, or in so much as you did think critically, uh, how did you dismiss the arguments which you now take to be kind of self-evident? -ev it's a while ago since I was Christian, and uh, I just don't remember what it was like to think quite so ridiculously. I, I, I guess I would say I think slightly less ridiculously. Now I might find that I'm, I'm, I'm wrong in my views at this point. But yeah, I'd be very interested to know, um, just because you have readier access, uh, readier access to it, how you feel about the way you thought and what you think uh, what you what do you think kept you thinking that way, Free Mike? You know, I I saw a great debate last year in uh, Kamloops, British Columbia, at Imagine No Religion Four about free will, and I think there were some hard determinists there, and and uh, Krauss was there. He he hates you know he, he's not a big fan of philosophy <laughs> philosophers. <laughs> And uh, you know, I myself, I don't know. I, I, I'm not necessarily convinced that, that we have absolutely no free will, that we are 100% hardwired and determined to take an action. We may have a hardwired predisposition, but I still see a cognitive process happening where you take an action, you choose a fork in the road. Of course, the question then becomes, was that fork predetermined because of my sort of, you know, my breakdown, how the machine of my mind is already hardwired? Will I automatically take this turn? Do I really, in that sense, have free will? And I really don't know the answer. It's probably a question for greater minds than my own. As far as addressing ridiculous belief, well, I totally understand how and why people could hold those beliefs as I did for so many years. I get it. I say now I look at it through a different lens. Back then, though, you know, I think there were many factors. In my case, it was because they got me while I was young. In religion, they call it the 4 to 14 window. Churches and religious organizations will hyper-target young people for that reason, because if you get someone at a very young and impressionable age, and you tell them stories about you know, floating zoos and supermen who gain power based on the length of their hair and, and talking animals and those types of things, and then everybody around them believes it and reinforces that, it becomes their normal. And so by the time they're 21 years old, it's just pretty much all they've ever known. It's, it's true, of course it's true. How could it not be true? If you were to take somebody who had never heard any of these stories and you caught them at the age of 21 and presented them the first time, they'd laugh you out of the room. Why is that? Well, in many cases, it's because they weren't gotten during that 4 to 14 window. I think the childhood indoctrination, which happened to me, is a hugely powerful and insidious thing. I stand against it. I did a, a speech that I traveled with a couple of years ago that's on YouTube now called Get Them While They're Young. It talks about the tactics used by religious organizations, churches, and otherwise to go after the young and the vulnerable. Get them early. Get them before they're exposed to other ideas. Lock them in. Lock them off. Do not let them be exposed to the world or they will become tainted. And I just think that's wrong. I mean, why in the world, especially if you were a true believer in the power of your position, why would you ever rope somebody off? Why would you cord them off? Why would you insulate and isolate? Geez, I would think if your position is that powerful, you would welcome challenge from everybody and anybody. Bring it. My God can handle this. Boom. You know, um, I think fear is a big part of it. I think people are afraid to challenge some of the more sinister scriptures, some of the more nonsensical scriptures, because they do fear hell and punishment. Um, I think there's a cultural aspect to it. I think people enjoy the comfort that religion brings. So, hey, why would I ever bother to challenge it? I enjoy it. I love going to church on Sundays. I love seeing my family and friends. I love being missed. I love the feeling of communal worship and hearing the positive messages. You know, you go hear Joel Osteen, who barely quotes scripture anymore. He's mostly a motivational coach. You are somebody. You have value. You know, go get him, tiger. <laughs> it's essentially what his whole life is about. People leave and they've had their kind of raw, raw moment and they get on with the rest of their lives. Why would they challenge that? It makes them feel good. 
And uh, I do think understanding why people believe is important if we're going to go in there and do battle. And I, I just don't think that you require living a lie, living a falsehood. I don't think you require that to have awe, to have community, to have inspiration, to have motivation, to to be able to, you know, to to have sort of a next level kind of life. Yeah, you know, that's the lie that was taught to us. If you don't have God, how can you have any quality? If you don't have God, how can you have joy? If you don't have God, how can you really suck the marrow out of every moment? Well, that's just crap. I'm actually much happier now, more liberated, more curious. Every day is a discovery. I am a better guy today than I ever was in religion. And I think if we can get people past the boundaries that they placed around themselves and that their families and cultures and pastors have placed around them, I think they will enjoy that kind of freedom as well. Mike is free. Okay, Seth, I heard you talk about your support for uh, people drawing uh, the depictions of the Prophet Muhammad in effigy. Uh, I, would wonder I was wondering whether or not you support the burning of the Korans. Right, uh, and you said that there should be no sacred cows. Uh, now, I kind of agree with you that obviously uh, I support freedom of speech and expression, but I also recognize that we live in a very complex world, right, where we have relationships with uh, Muslim countries with nuclear weapons, and we have allies which are Muslims, and we have a, a billion plus Muslims, right, and they have these sensitivities. So I am very keen on whether or not I support a particular instance of somebody trying to make an example, like by drawing cartoons, what's their motivations? I sort of analyze this very carefully before I start uh, putting my support behind it. And I was wondering if you had a nuanced approach to that. They had, uh, for example, this Terry guy, this pasture. He was burning, he was doing Koran demonstrations, and you had generals on the ground in Iraq, which was asking him, please stop this. We have people in Iraq burning, you know, this was affecting our relations with the Iraqi people, right? This had a real world consequence of, and potentially could get some of our soldiers killed. And I was wondering where, whether or not you factored any of those considerations in your thinking of supporting people, uh, you know, depicting the prophet or potentially burning the Quran. My trick. Well, I'll say this, I myself would never burn a Quran. I support it, you know, I, if someone wanted to burn a Bible or a Koran or, or any, any document anywhere, I support their right to do so without being in danger for their lives. I myself wouldn't do it because there are, in my opinion, better ways to get the message across and to, to change minds out there. Um, it's not, you know, it's not really my style. I mean, there's a, there's a, a thinking, and I don't even know if I totally agree with this. In the movement, in the atheist movement, you have the diplomats and you have the firebrands, and all tactics are wonderful and necessary and have their place. And, and I, you know, I just don't know that all ships are on sort of the even, <laughs> you know, I'm looking for the metaphor here, it's, it's late, but uh, I think... It, there are times when, I'll, I'll say it this way, and I say this often on the radio, it's not enough to be right. You have to be effective. Um, I can challenge the teachings of the Quran. I would like to go after the facts or lack of facts or the historicity of the Quran. That would be my tactic. Let's look at the characters in the Quran. Let's look at the edicts of Allah. Let's, let's look at the basic doctrine of Islam. Let's go there. I myself think that's a much more productive way of addressing the Quran rather than just setting fire to it. But I still support someone's right to be able to do so, even though it's something, it's not something I would do myself. I, I myself think there are probably better ways to go out and and um, have those discussions. Mike. <laughs> okay, cool. So basically, I think there's a lot of ignorance and religions all together around the world in terms of people of religions, and they misrepresent it really badly. I support your what you just said. In fact, if someone was burning the Quran, I wouldn't have any issues with it. In fact, Islam doesn't have any issues with it. Muslims do. Um, I think there's a lot of Muslims who have issues with things that they shouldn't have issues with. Same thing goes with Christianity or any other religion. But I do believe that. Uh, I do believe that. Uh, when you study religion, like you said, 
I respect that approach that, hey, let's look at the knowledge of it. Let's look at what's actually in the book and what it teaches. That would be one of them. That if you had pages of the Quran you wanted to get rid of, you light it on fire. In fact, it's the most respectful way of getting rid of pages of the Quran. In fact, that is the way to get rid of pages of the Quran you no longer want it. There's nothing harmful or insulting or offensive about it. Anyways, moving on from that, I think overall, religion itself is quite misunderstood, no matter whose religion it is. Uh, and man has altered it to his desires, his needs, which is why you've got a cow being worshipped here, you've got a man being worshipped there, you've got a Quran being burnt and people going crazy and correctly. So there's, it's all about ignorance and religions, I believe. And um, I, I think, I, I forgot what I was going to ask you earlier. <laughs> it was, you said so many things, I'm so lost. But it's really good listening to you guys, um, and it's my first time here. So if there is any questions in terms of that perspective of Islam, what Islam actually says, yeah, by all means, uh, I'd be more than happy to approach that angle. I also believe free will. Uh, I do believe that man has free will. I saw some really cheeky comments about people. Um, uh, uh, tactfully, no, I'm not afraid of that because that's actually the truth, what I just said. We could sit there academically, like Seth said, and we could discuss is burning the Quran aloud, and I would prove academically that yes, you can. And that takfiri person would feel pretty stupid. But anyways, um, I think overall, if you if you look at the free will of people, which you were mentioning earlier, the free will is something I believe that every person has the ability to choose this way or that way. And that is something that people can disagree with, and that is their free will. <laughs> they have the freedom to say, no, there is no free will. Um, anyway, so I think, I might, okay, I'll come back to what my question was. I kind of got lost in it. But... When it comes to religions themselves, when man constantly changes it and alters it to benefit their desires, I think there's far, far more evil and attacking of religions, no matter whose religion it is, by greed and people of different agendas. What do you say about that? That's what I think is a bigger issue in the world than any specific religion. And um, people spoke far longer than I did, but that's cool. I like with the mic. Okay, I'm not sure I'm completely clear. I, I get that man has corrupted religion. Before I answer the question, if I may, I'd like to ask you one so that I can color it in mind. But, but do you hold to a, a damnation or torment of any kind for the non-believer in Islam? Um, thank you. That's okay. That's quite a different topic altogether. When you're serious sure. about fighting uh, rebels, turn to rock retinol correction. When the fine lines that way, appear to fade, one month deep wrinkles look smoother. Like After one year, skin looks point. ageless. High bad, performance right? skin care only God from rock. Wanting to destroy people. I see God wanting to save people. If you believed in him, of course. If you don't, it doesn't matter anyway. So my answer is no that there is no damnation so long as a person's alive and they have time, no matter what religion they are, so long as they're alive, they're not damned. People say, oh, you're this, so you're damned. I don't believe that. I believe people, so long as they're alive, they have time to think and reflect and change their ways. And people can always change and become better and believe in what's better for them. And God knows best. I hope that answers that question. Okay, well, I, I'm not sure if you're speaking about some sort of a damnation during their lives. I'm talking about their post-physical existence, you know, posthumous existence. Is there a torment of some kind? And the reason that I brought it up is that uh, many of the major monotheistic religions do have a torment in mind for the infidel, for the unbeliever, right? For the person who does not hold to their particular deity, who does not say the salvation prayer, who does not line up in some specific way. And I always go back to the analogy of someone whose children were in a burning house and the inferno was just insane deadly deadly flames and this person this adult standing outside watching knew one path for the children to get from the back bedroom where they were looking out the window screaming for help all the way downstairs and out the front door to safety now would that parent with eternity in the balance, let's call it damnation, let's call it hellfire, let's call it death with a capital D in this case, would that parent decide that it would allow anyone else anywhere to corrupt their instructions for salvation? Would that parent say, you know, I'm gonna write this down on a napkin 
I'm going to give it to somebody else. They're going to give it to somebody else and they're going to pass it. And someone so is going to, then he's going to yell it into a bullhorn to somebody else who's got a walkie talkie and they'll do this and they're going to rewrite it. And someone else has a word. Pro, I mean, what, whatever. And it goes through this game of telephone and then we'll get the instructions to the children. And hopefully everybody will get the correct information, which will get them safe and out the front door to, uh, to be able to be free and to, to stay alive. Well, that's just ridiculous. You know, no loving, caring, uh, certainly an omnipotent parent would ever allow the message to be corrupted by fallible people or through a fallible process. If they really cared, they would make sure the message was given directly and immediately. You need to go here, you need to take this left, go down here, grab a blanket, dip it in water, come down, get close to the floor. You're gonna to wanna to go right, left, here's the door, look for the light, follow my voice, whatever, and they will find safety. And they'll do whatever it takes to make sure the children do that. The idea that a loving parent would say, I'm gonna allow somebody else to screw this up, potentially killing my beloved children is to me ludicrous and so when someone says well man has corrupted god's message man has corrupted religion man has sort of gotten in the way and he's muddied the waters and people have gotten it all wrong these days it ignores the larger question of why a loving and involved deity does not immediately part the curtain of the sky and say hey everybody here's who i am here's my first name here's my last name here's what i want you to do Here's what will happen if you do and if you don't do it, period. And if he's genuinely God, all 7 billion inhabitants of planet Earth would hear the message clearly and immediately, right? Why would a loving, involved, benevolent deity ever need an apologist? Why would he ever need someone to interpret his message? And why would he ever sit back and allow his message to be screwed up with heaven and hell in the balance, with eternity in the balance? Hell, even if you believe in annihilation, it still means that millions, perhaps billions, actually definitely billions of your children will never get to spend eternity with you because they got the wrong message. Uh, Seth, my question for you is this. Do you have one good reason to support the idea, or excuse me, the proposition, that there is no God in existence, okay? Do you have one good reason to support the proposition that no God exists? And I'm going to define God as an eternal entity, which is non-contingent, possesses the attributes of intelligence and consciousness and the power to bring matter and energy into existence and to create the universe, okay? Free mic. I'm not sure if you were here earlier, um, but I answered the question like this. I am an agnostic atheist. I do not believe in a God because I see no evidence to support the existence of a God, but I cannot prove or demonstrate that a God does not exist. I can't prove that there's not something out there somewhere. And of course the definitions will change from person to person. Uh, story to story, religion to religion, whatever, something out there somewhere, knock yourself out. I, I can't disprove it, but that's not how we determine truth. And uh, so if you're asking me if I can automatically disprove that there might be a, a deity out there somewhere, well, I can't disprove it any more than I can disprove fairies or, uh, you know, uh, those types of things. But that's not how I approach the issue of God. I start over here and I say, well, show me the evidence for his, uh, a God of any kind, supernatural acts, um, demonstrations of godlike ability, and we'll start from there. Mike's free. All right, so uh, a different direction. Uh, I, I'm interested in religious demographics and how they change over time because I'm interested in, in the big picture of this social and intellectual movement. Uh, and I, I can't imagine you haven't seen this, but it just came out yesterday, this new study. So if so, I'm happy to be the bearer of good news. Um, it was this big Pew study yesterday, their U.S. religious landscape for 2014, which is their most recent religious demographic profile since 2007. And Pew also did, just a few weeks ago, the global religious landscape projection for 2050, which was a really cool one, and both had big news for unaffiliated or nuns uh, and atheists. 
So the one yesterday, the unaffiliated are now 20% of the population in the U.S., the second largest demographic. So they're larger than Catholics and they're larger than mainline Protestants. Only evangelicals are larger. And the self-defined atheists and agnostics, the subset of the unaffiliated, went from 4% to 7%, with self-defined atheists doubling in that time period. Meanwhile, Christianity went down from uh, 78% to 70% in this just seven years, so dropping more than a percent a year. Uh, also, um, within atheism, uh, in a similar time period, the atheist subset went from 16% women to 43% women, so a tripling of the representation of women, almost parity, and now I think over 25% minority, which is really substantial. So you know, these changes sort of creep up on you. Um, so I, I'm wondering about your reflections or reactions. Uh, are you seeing or experiencing these changes in the atheist community now that you've been a part of it for a number of years? Uh, do you have any expectations or, or hopes for the future? Uh, as the atheists and the unaffiliated uh, navigate these changes. Uh, thank you. Before I answer, I have to just address the line by Evolution False, which I just happened to see in the chat room. So there you have it. Seth has no good reason that atheism as a proposition is true. Well, atheism is not a proposition. Atheism is a declaration of non-belief in a deity, right? for whatever reason. It just says, I don't believe. It's not that I don't know, I don't believe. But there's this weird thing that apologists do when they say, um, when you either, when you decided to be an atheist or atheism as a proposition is true, capital T-R-U-E. And quite frankly, most of the free thinkers that I know don't exist in a world where they are ready to put a capital T on true. They're always willing to revise and change their positions based on the evidence. As far as the statistics, I saw the study. I posted it on the Thinking Atheist social media pages yesterday. And I think it's it's not surprising that the nuns, the non-religious, the unaffiliated, that demographic is really starting to go up. We have to resist the temptation to say atheism because they're not all atheists. They are simply unaffiliated, right? It means that they're not committed, they're not really anywhere necessarily. Some are atheists, but not necessarily even the majority of them, but it's encouraging. You know, I saw Catholicism is sliding down, Christianity is sliding down. It did say, I believe, that evangelicals are slightly on the rise percentage-wise. And I think as we see the rise, what I call the rise of reason, we see better information. Somebody says something from the pulpit, anybody can pull up their smartphone on Google and they can go check it with a vetted, reliable source, you know, and get the information from scientists and all those kind of things, and uh, check it and say, well, actually, there's no truth to that. We're seeing more and more people sort of setting themselves free, and I think those, inf those statistics are going to continue to go north. It's going to continue and continue and continue. Now, as that happens, those who had previously held almost a monopoly on the conversation, right? Those who had posited that their belief, their worldview, their position was sacred and could not be challenged are going to continue to freak. And they're going to get even freakier as time goes by. You think Pat Robertson's out of control now? Get ready. You think Sarah Balin's saying some crazy stuff now? Get ready. You think the apologists and the pulpit pounders and the evangelists and the doomsayers are going crazy now? Get ready because it's going to get worse. And they can in many ways be dangerous in this way. It's like a wounded animal, right? Sometimes a wounded animal is the most dangerous. They're going to have to be careful. We're certainly going to have to stay vigilant and make sure that good information continues to trump bad information out there. But I was delighted to see the study, and I'd like to see that number in another seven years. I think it's going to be awesome. Mike Spree. Uh, speaking on the issue of truth with a capital T, which is a huge issue we can't get into tonight, I'm going to ask you a question that I've asked other guest speakers in the room, and I think it's an interesting question. Imagine a Christian who, uh, again, isn't, uh, doesn't have a problem with gay people, doesn't have any offensive political views, tends to be progressive, but they do believe that Jesus Christ died for them. They probably believe some of the New Testament, some of the odd things in the Bible. But it helps them get through life. But it doesn't interfere with anything that we have a moral or political objection to. 
Is it wrong, in your opinion, to be irrational fundamentally? Do human beings have or should have an allegiance to something called the truth, even if using our imagination and irrationality makes our lives better and doesn't hurt people? Um, do we need always to use the truth? Could we not think of the imagination or rationality as an incredible evolutionary development in which we solve problems that we couldn't using empiricism or physicalism to calm ourselves down, to create social bonds, to love one another, to care for one another. This, of course, not ignoring the horrendous problems that things like religion and irrationality has caused, which should be challenged, uh, just like you're doing. But again, the fundamental question I'll get off the mic is, do we have an allegiance to something called truth? Or is that the new religion of scientism where we need to believe uh, in an allegiance to something? Uh, is that not just the new religion now? I yield the mic. Well, I want to make sure I understand the question. I heard something about the need to believe someone who might be believing, and yet they are relatively harmless, if I was getting it right. Uh, they hold a belief because it provides fulfillment for them. It gives them, it sort of scratches an itch in their life. But they aren't necessarily on the offense out there trying to muddy the waters or toxify the waters of science. Uh, I'm guessing that's part of your question. If I got it wrong, forgive me. Uh, and say so in the chat room, and I'll try to come back and address the question that you did ask. Um, I've often said my problem is not with the deist. You know, or even the casually religious. My problem comes when the more fundamental aspects of religion result in action. And religion, in many cases, by design, is supposed to ripple outward and change minds. Right? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? They are charged to go change minds. You think these mission trips overseas, right? They're going and feeding them physically, but they are going after the mind and the soul. And I think quite often, it's not quite that simple. I just believe in Jesus and he makes me happy. That doesn't threaten me. It doesn't bother me at all. Knock yourself out. It's when you begin to co-opt the political systems for your own ends, when you begin to go after the, the young and the vulnerable, the people who are in positions of need, and you take advantage of that need, and you sell them lies. Uh, I've got a problem. And I just don't know that you need to lie to people to give them fulfillment in that way. Um, do, I, do I begrudge the right of an individual to hold a personal belief that makes them happy? No. I mean, they have a constitutional protected right. I'll fight for that right. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's something, if I have a right to be a non-believer, you have a right to be a believer. And if it makes you happy, cool. My problem is, is then in so many cases, religion is not designed to be an inward focused religion. It is designed to explode outward and to, for lack of a better word, infect. And in those cases, yeah, I think we have to destroy it. I think we have to destroy bad ideas to make more room for good ideas. And if that wasn't an answer to your question, I do apologize. Let me know, and I'll try to go back and cover that ground. Mike is free. Uh, Seth, so first I want to say, be not concerned about evolution false. <clears throat> evolution false is well on his way to becoming an atheist. He admitted recently that uh, he understands that Christianity is an inherently circular uh, actually absolutely and universally fallacious worldview. So when he tells you that you're not being coherent, just <laughs> really um, don't worry. He is uh, evolution false, to put it politely, I think, a work in progress. Um, so the question that I wanted to I wanted to ask you was, um, again, so so many people are, are, are atheists here, so you know, I'm, I'm attempting to ask you contentious questions that, that sort of question atheism, even though uh, my position is, I think, like yours, agnostic atheism. Uh, there is lots of evidence that people draw great support from the community aspect of religion. And some of your comments alluded to that as well, that you enjoy going to church and uh, the regular community on Sunday and so on. There's evidence that this is uh, prophylactic against depression and uh, that it binds communities together in a, in, in a useful way. Indeed, there's some evidence from uh, um, anthropology uh, that uh, it may be the case that actually for societies to have got together at the scale which they have, for groups to have, have cooperated, 
in, in, in the large fashion in which they did when we uh, surmounted uh, the limits of, of tribalism, that the religion was, it was essential to that process. And so my question thereupon is, what do you imagine in atheism or in a, in a secular world replaces the community uh, uh, aspects of religion? Do they need replacing, I, I suppose, would be the first question. And secondly, you know, what do you think that atheism has to offer? One thing that I, I would just mention quickly is that there seems to be a modern obsession with fame and um, uh, I suppose celebrity. Uh, I, I notice some correlates here that if religion is a means of transcending death and a way of sort of instantiating some sort of immortality, it would follow that people's craving for celebrity and fascina fascination with celebrity and people who will be remembered and venerated may be a reaction to a sort of lack of, of religious transcendence of death, right? And this is a sort of ornate cultural theory, but I, I'm saying, uh, I, I suppose the sort of meta part of that question is surely some things must be lost when we lose religion. Religion surely isn't an unalloyed bad. So in the first instance, uh, do we, how do we replace the community aspects if they do indeed need replacing? And second, sec secondarily, is there anything that you think uh, may be good about religion that we do regrettably lose, but you know, that we have to junk because we can eventually do better than, than you know, whatever it is that religion offers in that regard? Uh, so your mic. Well, I probably part ways regarding um, sort of those who are seeking a type of notoriety or celebrity uh, because they're scratching some sort of a community itch in some way. Uh, I think that has to do more with the nature of uh, a world connected in real time by the internet, social media. And kind of a narcissistic thing that uh, quite often sort of drives you know many people. I mean, I, even in radio, it was true. I remember someone asked me once: uh, are, "Are broadcasters, people who go into show business or radio for for a living, are you are you insecure, egotistical, or insane?" And the answer was always just yes, right? Yes. So I think uh, the medium has a little bit more to do with that than anything else. Um, I think that. We make a mistake when we say, do we need to do things as free thinkers like the church? Do we need to emulate the church? Because what we're doing is we're surrendering ground to the church that never belonged to the church to begin with. The church does community very well, very very well, bring people together under a common tent, common goal, common interests, and enjoy time together and do things to make the world a better place together. The church is amazing at this, but the church didn't invent it and the church does not own it. And I know many people who are atheists and they are individuals, rugged individuals, they are independent, they are no longer one of the sheep. They flip out whenever you talk about going to an atheist event or a Sunday assembly or a convention or some sort of gathering or group because, you know, I will, I left church, man. I'm not going back. I not. I didn't give up one church just to go be a sheep and another herd people. I'm not going. And I think that's just wrong-headed because we as communal creatures need each other. We're relational beings. We're better in numbers, in most cases, better in numbers. You know, why wouldn't we want to come together to celebrate common interests, to challenge each other, to try to, to affect change together? We can be one soldier throwing pebbles against the castle wall, or we can be an army of 500,000 doing that. And, um, and I think, you know, if, if coming together as an atheist is church, which is not, if it's coming together as church, Comic-Con is church, okay? You know, bowling night is church. Going to a rock concert is church. Coming together as a group is just something people do and have always done. And, uh, you know, the church can say, well, you're just being church, but it doesn't mean that the church invented it. You know, this was here long before the church existed, and it will be here long after the church is gone if the church ever goes. I just think it's a, it's a human thing. I think it's an important thing. And I totally support opportunities for people to get together and to share experiences and to 
sort of build life together. You know, my life is better with other people in it. And I crave that as a human being. And I think we should celebrate it. We certainly shouldn't be nervous about doing it because we think, oh, geez, I sure don't want the church to accuse me of being one of them. Because, you know, then you're allowing someone else to define you. Now I just go and enjoy it for what it is, a human experience. Mike is free. Uh, can I get a one? I think this works. Hi, Seth. Um, okay, I'm back. I waited. Um, your question was about, first of all, I can just comment on what you just said. That was awesome. Um, I, I travel the world quite a bit. I'm in the UK now. I give lectures at universities. I do interfaith stuff. I do a lot of charity work as well, um, helping people in Nepal and Haiti when that disaster happened, etc. And I met people of all different kinds of faith. And meeting people from all these different backgrounds kind of says exactly what you're saying, but how man has constantly changed a religion. So going back to what you said earlier, why God, like a parent, takes children to her house and doesn't guide them correctly, directly, and so on and so forth. As a Muslim, I've always found that it was a direct conversation. Uh, one who studied the Bible long before and then studying the Quran, I found the Quran always talked directly to me, which is something you said you'd welcome academically conversing and discussing. I'd love that sometime. But right now, just to just to go back to that question we had earlier, hellfire, does it exist? Yeah, it does. It's a deterrent. Does God want people to go to it? Why doesn't he just give a clear answer or a clear guidance? I believe he does. That's the thing. And I think many people have made it very difficult. People of different religions, they've made it very difficult. And they made it look like, it, you know, you, you broke a pin, you're going to hell. You looked at a woman's leg, you're going to hell. I think that has really ruined religion. That's not what God's about. God's always said, all I want you to do is don't put any attributes between you and I. It's me and you direct, no man, no good luck charm, no wishing upon a star, it's just me and you, ask and I'll answer. It's that kind of a relationship, and I believe it's just that simple. Anything beyond that, people can make mistakes and go astray, commit sins, but those people who corrupt and those people who take it the wrong way, those are people who only want evil. So my question to you is, isn't it that there are people who are just downright set on being evil and wanting to deceive or mislead, including the greed of certain people who want to use one country against another and create, uh, um, you know, create that hate between one religion and another. I don't believe it's any religion calls to go into evil, fight and defend, yes, but not do evil, which people of those religions have created that, but more so exploited by greedy corporates or greedy media or something else that's causing a lot more hate and making it bigger than it is. Do you feel or do you think that there is that kind of atmosphere out there? Just quickly for a second, you shift. There are organizations that call for hate. I'm not one of them. And I know some things have been said about me online. I gladly clear that up. It's all nonsense. Um, Take it out of context. I've never gotten involved in anything like that. Anyways, back to you, Seth. What do you think about that? Thank you, Mike. Back to you. Well, I think I answered the question earlier. You know, I think if God genuinely cares, he must make the message palatable and clear to the lowest common denominator. You know, he has to make the message clear to those who don't have access to the Quran and the PhD studies course about the Quran and interpretations of the Quran and all that kind of stuff. It has to be clear you know, beyond doubt to anyone and everyone. And so far, he's been so clear that, uh, you know, more than two thirds of the planet worships somebody else or nobody at all. The idea that hell exists, but God doesn't want you to go there is just crazy. And God created hell. God created hell. And God hand places you in hell. And if God genuinely saw everything coming, meaning God was omniscient, God would have foreseen the damnation of billions in advance and continued with his plan anyway. So he already foreknew that things were going to go to hell, they're going to go south, billions are going to burn, and he didn't change the plan. Omniscience, omnipotence, benevolence, hugely in question. This is not godlike behavior. It's incompetent, potentially cruel behavior. And I think it's fortunate that we can largely ignore it based on the lack of evidence. Mike is free. Uh, when I joined the Navy in 1968, I wrote on my application when they asked me what religion I was, and, and, I, and I wrote none. 
They put products in it on my dog tags. <clears throat> when I was in boot camp, they forced us all to go to some kind of religious service. And knowing that uh, the military uses our tax dollars to pay for the chaplain, his assistants, his vehicle, uh, his quarters, and his church, do you believe that uh, the military violates the separation of church and state? Um, yeah, I think absolutely every day the, the military oversteps the church state boundary. We live in a God and cult, we live in a God and country culture, don't we? You know, the two words are placed side by side. The idea that you are in the military means you're not just representing the United States of America or whatever. You are representing the almighty God and you, you know, you are, you rely on God when you become afraid, when you are in the foxhole. God is a coping mechanism, those types of things. The church services, I've had messages from people where they were given a choice. They could either go to the church service. Now, this is a, couple, a few years ago. I don't know if the policy has changed yet. Um, but they could either go to the church service or they had to go and do some kind of manual labor. <laughs> you know, yeah, what, kind of a, what kind of a deal is that? You can either go to the Sunday morning church for religion X, or you can go and scrub the head. You know, I, I just don't get that. And um, so, yeah, I think it's, and, and it that is going to be a long, tough, tough, tough battle. I think it's a necessary battle. I know um, uh, Weinstein and uh, some other folks have been eyeball deep in that particular battle. And it's not a popular fight, but I think it's an important fight. Dr. Jason Heap, current applicant to become the first humanist chaplain in the history of the United States Armed Forces. And uh, yeah, he'll be the very first ever. And I think that's pretty important stuff. So we'll see what happens. Mike's free. Uh, in response to my question, Seth, about atheism as a proposition, you made the following statement that you said, I see no evidence for God. Now, I have a two-part question. The first question is, what would the evidence for God necessarily be if God did exist that you say is absent? Okay? What would the evidence for God be, necessarily be, that you say is absent? The second question is, since you say you see no evidence, and I can only conclude that's a veiled proposition that the universe is not evidence for God in your view, and since you cannot demonstrate according to your first answer that you cannot show God does not exist, then can you tell us, do you know what in fact did produce the universe, therefore ruling out God as a possible explanation? Free mic. Sorry, I'm fumbling with the uh, lock mic button here. Forgive me. Well, you know, the beauty of it is, is that if God exists, I wouldn't have to know what he would need to prove himself to me, would I? And God would know. He could prove himself without question. So it's kind of an academic question in the first place. For my part, I'd like to see something measurable, something we could measure via the scientific method, something that goes beyond personal experience claims, things that cannot be explained through other means. You know, I was cured of a cold. It was Yahweh, Allah, Zeus, Thor, Wotan, whoever. I mean, come on. But if God truly exists and he is God-like, well, he knows what it would take to convince not just me, but the seven billion inhabitants of this planet, and the burden remains upon him. Do I know what produced the universe? Of course not. Can I rule out a deity, a God? Well, no more than I can rule out a fairy or, you know, a, a flying space octopus or something else. You know, I, I don't know. No one knows yet what caused uh, the Big Bang to bring the universe into sort of fruition, what spun all the planets into the, their current places. But I mean, the idea that it's a god has no more credence than really any other explanation, actually less, because we don't necessarily see a divine hand. We certainly don't see benevolence. I mean, especially if you hold to one of the major monotheistic religions, what you're saying is, is that God's master plan was to create a, a universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies so that he could take his most important and precious children, hide them on a rock in a dark corner of them, and send most of them to hell. I mean, I think we can discount that one pretty easily. A few more. Mike is free. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for taking, for coming into the room and doing the Q&A, Seth. Uh, Seth Andrews, 
Um, Olivia and and David, the room owners, have been uh, advertising and uh, looking forward to you coming for quite a while. So, and uh, I'm a room regular. So, if you get a chance, please add me to your palace so we can talk later. Now, um, the person that you just spoke with, Evolution Falls, is a um, room regular, and he has his own room. He has a, uh, a, a kind of a group of Christian groupies that uh, will that he can call into his own personal debate room whenever he uh, chooses. And uh, he frequently comes in here, and he used to talk about uh, prove that there isn't a God. Show me your evidence there isn't a God. But these days, he likes to say that the laws of logic, quote, are universal and absolute on his side of the argument, and then challenge atheists or anyone that disagrees with him to, um, to prove that their logic is absolute and universal. And the usual answer that he gets back is, uh, we don't have to prove that our logic is absolute and universal. We just have to um, know enough to reject or dismiss your claims. And Evolution False often responds that the people answering him are stupid. And, uh, well, I personally have a hard time arguing with him, so if you could offer any assistance or suggestions on how to argue this point, it would be greatly appreciated. Passing the mic. Well, before I get into a debate or discussion, if it's just me and them, one-on-one, -on -one, and I know they're not listening, I don't waste my time. Right? If they're sending but not receiving, and nobody else is around to see the arguments presented, what am I doing there? You know, why in the world would I waste my time? We're not having any real discussion. If you are in a room where there might be someone who is interested in actually seeing that both sides are presented, or many sides presented, and they are vetting the information and assimilating the information because they want to come to a better conclusion or they want to make sure that they are standing on you know good evidence they have good reasons for believing what they believe etc then i think those discussions can be had with people like evolution falls because they get the ideas out there um i myself i i love the idea of bringing in people who are genuine experts in the field of evolutionary biology it's amazing what can happen when you bring in real scientists and have them talk about their areas of expertise. You can learn so much. I had, in fact, you know what? The uh, radio shows are online. You can go back and watch them or listen to them rather in the archive. I've got the uh, Why Evolution is True broadcast with evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne. Fascinating show. Just fascinating to hear someone who knows what they're talking about, right? They're not there to defend a position. They're simply saying, this is what the evidence says. This is what the overwhelming avalanche of evidence says. And it's amazing, right? And I had Dr. Donald Prothero on, you know, he's a paleontologist to talk about the truth of Noah's Ark and other types of things, you know, debunking creationist claims and really learning some extremely cool stuff about paleontology, about the dinosaurs. It is amazing. So I'm a big fan of leaning to the experts. I don't think we can necessarily, we always surrender the position because we don't have a PhD somewhere. Because, you know, even Deepak Chopra has a PhD. I mean, we, we're arguing evidence, we're arguing information, but let's play to our strengths. Let's talk to people. And when you bring on a scientist, bring on a scientist. Don't bring on somebody who went to the Discovery Institute and signed a waiver that said he would reject any quote unquote fact if it didn't fit into the Christian Bible. That's not how science works. It's not what scientists do. True scientists. True scientists are prepared to examine the evidence day by day and change their position. Bring in people who know what they're about and let them talk about what they do for a living, many times a life work. And I think that with people in the wings who are watching and listening, who might actually find a moment of enlightenment, say, actually, I hear better ideas, and they'll change their position based on the evidence. If it's just you and him or you and her, nobody else, and they're not listening, you're wasting your time, walk away. Mike's free. So Seth, I um, appreciate your, your thoughts. Um, you know, was a Christian most of my life and now have, um, you know, really interested in why people believe what they believe and not necessarily what they believe. But 
Um, I'm always confronted, and I'm interested in your comments in terms of when you're confronted with people, and I'm speaking now of, you know, maybe the older generation, maybe 40, 50, 60 on up. Um, when you're confronted with people who have doubts now and really start struggling with their faith and looking, they're kind of right on the verge of maybe, you know, losing, uh, becoming one of the non-affiliated uh, members of that study, what are the best arguments or what's the first thing that you would uh, say to them or that would maybe turn their head a little bit in terms of what, what experience have you had and what arguments uh, have you brought to the to bear to maybe give them, open their eyes a little bit so they, um, they can see, um, be more reasonable in terms of their ideology. Maybe you could just talk about that for a second. Mike Free. Well, much of the people who contact me, and I get email from all over the world, they are terrified that their doubt is a sin. It's a lack of faith. I'm not a good enough believer. I'm not doing it right. I'm broken. Or it's the temptation or influence of the evil one. It's an attack of Satan, that kind of thing. And I just stop them and say, hang on just a second, okay? What worthy father would punish you for asking questions and expecting good answers, right? What worthy father would punish doubt? I have a speech that I did uh, last year. I keep referencing speeches, but I address lots of these things when I'm out and about. And one's called The Beauty of Doubt. And it sort of turns the tables on the idea of doubt, where when I was a believer, doubt was a sin. It's a sin. Don't doubt. Don't doubt. The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, you know. And I've come to, to believe that doubt is a wonderful, powerful, and extremely useful tool for determining facts. And how do you vet information if you never doubt it? If somebody shows up at your door and they say they could show you a trick that will make you a million dollars overnight. Well, of course you doubt it, right? Just give me your credit card number, I'll show you. Well, you doubt that, and in doubting, you actually are able to protect yourself and take the time to vet the claim being presented. Doubt is an amazing thing. By that standard, my favorite disciple in the Christian Bible is not Peter, Paul, right? it's Thomas. Doubting Thomas is the one who got it right when Jesus showed up, right, after the crucifixion, and Thomas said, oh, actually, show me the nail holes, man. Show me that stuff. I want to see evidence. Let me stick my finger in his side and make sure that that's, and, and that's, I think that's, that's what I try to encourage people to do. You know, doubt, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid to live your own life. Many parents get upset because their family members, their children aren't living the life that the parents had set out for them. Well, I remind them, your life doesn't belong to them. And finally, and I wrote a letter, I actually call it a letter of encouragement on my blog at thethinkingatheist.com, where I remind them that they are absolutely beautiful just the way they are. They don't need their worth given to them by a third party somewhere. They don't have to live life according to somebody else's rules somewhere. They can be who they are. They can live life on their terms. They can carve their own path. They can be curious. They can challenge stuff that doesn't sound right, look right, feel right, and they can do so without apology. And it doesn't mean they are broken or ugly in any way. They're not shameful. Uh, they are, they're beautiful. They have real worth. And that's where I start with them. Forgive the long answer. That's the only kind I can really give. <laughs> but I mean, that's what I do is I just say, you, you know, it's a beautiful thing that you are here. You got one shot that we know of on this planet. Make the most of it challenge, ask the question, stop apologizing for asking questions, go get them. And uh, if somebody else doesn't like the fact that you're living life on your own terms, or for some reason you make them uncomfortable, that's their problem. And with that word of encouragement, I try to embolden them to continue a life of curiosity. Mike is free. Okay, thank you, Seth, uh, Seth, and thank you for your time for being so generous uh, with everyone here. Um, I just simply like to. I'm from speaking from England, so it's a bit late right now. Uh, I just wanted to ask you your thoughts on this particular, because I like the way that you've expressed your thoughts on different subjects tonight. Um, basically, I'm a fan of Sam Harris. I actually listened. Uh, I've read a lot of his books, 
And from what my thoughts on this is that uh, from what I gather, I mean, his first book, at least the first one I came across, was uh, a letter to a Christian nation where he tried to set out, like he basically tried to have a conversation with Americans, I guess, uh, in regards to religion. Then he did the, the end of faith, which he then tore apart uh, a lot of the monotheistic Abrahamic religions, uh, where he also tried to distinguish, uh, you know, put a, a very definitive this uh, difference between the monotheistic Abrahamic religions and other religions such as Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, and then he did the moral landscape, which to me was an atheist attempt to uh, show that we can have morality without religion. And now his recent book, uh, Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion. Now, from my perspective, at least my thoughts on this, is that here is an atheist who's trying to set out a pattern or an or a, a, a answer all the various questions that religion always had dominance over, such as, you know, religious people always say morality, you can't have morality without God, and they always profess how their morality is the supreme morality, and, and also spirituality, which was always in the realms of, uh, of, the, of the sort of supernatural uh, and, and sort of religion. He is attempting to basically fill these gaps, which a person who I think finds themselves in an atheistic worldview may have gaps. I think we still want to be spiritual. I mean, my, my final, my, my actual question is, do you, what, first of all, what do you think about this path that, that Sam Harris has taken? Second of all, do you think that we still need to have a form of spirituality within us, uh, or as, as a human being, is this a human need? Is this an evolutionary need that we still need to have a, a, a way of expressing uh, spirituality, but not necessarily with the metaphysical baggage that, you know, spirituality tends to come with, a, a atheistic form of spirituality, um, and, and sort of reflecting on our cognitive subject object duality, all that stuff. Thank you. Well, we have to start with the definition of spirituality. I know many people use spiritual to sort of define the transcendent, meaning it's a moment of awe and wonder, an amazing sort of an intersection of things in their lives that are beyond description in some way. The birth of a child, it's so amazing, it's beautiful. It's a moment that seems almost spiritual. Uh, when you see some sort of a vista somewhere and you think, I, I can't even put into words what I'm feeling. It's just, it feels like a, a, a sp I'm spiritual. It feels like a spiritual moment. If that's how you define it, I think you can call it whatever you want. You know, call it Bob. I don't care what you call it. Um, I don't think we have any evidence for a supernatural definition of the words um, spiritual. I just don't think that we have anything we can really sink our teeth into. Everybody defines it a little bit differently. I do think people are often eager to make that connection. They see something that takes their breath away and it sweeps them off their feet and they they see it as, you know, they, do they see a higher power? Do they see a, another worldly membrane? Well, maybe they do, but in my world, you're going to have to demonstrate that in some way. Otherwise, I really can't do much with it. But there's a misconception that just because you are an atheist, that your life is without awe and wonder, that you don't have those moments of, for lack of a better way of saying it, transcendence, you know, where you just, you just, you, you feel fully alive. Every cell of your body feels alive. You feel the moment in a way that's beyond description. I think as an atheist, I have those moments even more than I ever did when I was a believer. You know, I, I felt quote unquote, felt um, what I thought was God or something God-like or something amazing and, and awe-inspiring. But now that I look back, I realize it was a cheat. I had sort of painted God into something else. And now that I look around at the universe as it really is, and I see the amazing wonder of being alive and experiencing it firsthand, I mean, I feel awe and wonder and and just a tremendous sense of, of being alive. Now, you can call that spiritual if you want, but I don't think you have to. I, you know, I, I think uh, you certainly don't have to 
paint a supernatural connotation onto it, especially as we don't have any evidence that there is a supernatural connotation. We'll do one more and call it a night. Mike's free. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Andrews, for coming into the room. Uh, I think my question is, <laughs> undoubtedly to the surprise of everyone here who knows me, centered in uh, in what we're, what is coming out of uh, neuroscience, neuropsychology, et cetera, et cetera, which is that uh, we are increasingly finding, and it's also coming out in social psych and other things, that um, people uh, walk through the world, not only as we're beginning to understand with an increasing amount of difficulty even seeing things that are directly in front of them, we, we're constantly translating the world that we see, but what's worse that our um, biases, preconceptions and cueing can so distort anything that we are given that at times, even when faced with data contrary to a position we already hold, we will reorganize it and try to get it to agree with us. So my question as a pluralist and a positivist is, okay, I see that religion has, as we've already mentioned, social, social utility and emotional utility. We can argue those things and, and say, okay, they have some of these things. Um, my question, though, is that um, inherent in a humanist worldview is a humility. Right, the understanding that one's place in the universe might not be all that special, as you've already mentioned, that um, there's a, there's a sort of mediocrity principle that exists between us, right? Not just in our place in the universe, but in our place relative to each other. So my question is, what emotional, um, what can we offer them? I mean, we talked a bit about awe and wonder, but I don't know how we managed to get something. I mean, clearly, as I've already mentioned, data doesn't work so well because people reorganize it, and sometimes even when they don't intend to. And I'm, I'm, I'm not pretending I'm free from that either. I'm sure that I do it as well. Um, so if data doesn't work, information doesn't necessarily work, then what um, can we give people who are moved by emotionality, charismatic speaking, um, all of these things that allows them to still have, if you'll pardon the bluntness, a kind of narcissism? where they are allowed to feel special and worthwhile and somehow existing beyond themselves enough to make it attractive. And forgive me if it, I'm trying to talk a bit around something that's rather complicated, but I'm sure, you know, if, if you could help me out, I'd be grateful. And nice to meet you, by the way. Mike Free. No, I totally understand it. It's funny when you were talking about how people reinforce these emotional investments that they've made in ideas. Again, I'm doing a presentation around the country called I Love the Idea. We talk about things like belief perseverance, where you know someone says something, gives you the facts, as you had alluded to, and instead of saying, oh, wow, allow me to examine my data and improve my position where necessary, uh, we double down and say, oh, you know what? You're wrong. I'm double right now. We, it's, it's, it, it's not about logic. Uh, it's also harder, I think, to challenge beloved beliefs, cherished beliefs. I was reading in Scientific America about uh, Spinoza's conjecture, you know, about, it was uh, named after the Dutch philosopher, uh, Benedict Spinoza, talking about how that acceptance of something as being true is the easy part. Disbelief is actually another step. It takes us more time. It's harder to analyze it, to vet it, to put it under the microscope. And so the rejection of a claim actually is a harder thing for people to do when acceptance is so easy, you know? So I totally understand. And people bond themselves emotionally to these ideas. They, they love the sort of the construct in their mind of what these things are and what they're about, and, and they don't want to give them up. I don't, I, I totally agree that in many cases you will not win on the data, right? You cannot show them the, the avalanche of facts about evolutionary biology and see them still hold to Genesis chapter one and think that the data is all we need. <laughs> you know, the data is not all we need. What I have found interesting was I recently did an interview with sociologist, Dr. Ryan Cragen, He's based out of Tampa, Florida. He's got some great books out. And he did some recent research that said probably the biggest tool we have in getting people to reassess their position and soften their fundamentalist attitudes and begin to re-examine 
where they are and what they think is changing their social circles. So if they look across the, the river and they see the atheist over there or the agnostic or someone of another religion, it's easy for them to be afraid and to throw stones and to speak about those people only in caricature. But if they bump elbows every day with somebody who is an atheist or someone of a different faith, and they see that person as one who loves their family and loves to laugh and is a productive part of the world and just enjoys every moment and is a positive, beautiful force in their life, well, it's, it's harder to discount that, right? And now you begin to think, well, you know, I, I, I think they're going to hell, but they're such an amazing person. And they're not stupid. I mean, he's so smart. They're so smart. She's so smart. They're, why would God ever send that person to hell? Before you know it, you're now softening these harder edges of belief, of tribalism, of people sort of boundaries around the, each other and, and how they cordon themselves off. And they are starting to, if not accept, at least entertain other ideas. And I honestly think there's a lot of merit to that. I think let's change the social circles that these believers are in so that they interact on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe they do and don't even realize they do. Interact with people who disagree with them, who might even be an atheist, and allow them to see non-believers, humanist, secular people in three dimensions instead of the caricature that has been painted in their minds. And that's when I think true dialogue begins. And it also provides for them an example that someone who does not hold to their particular deity or dogma can have an amazing freaking life. Maybe even a better life than they do. And they can experience all the amazing stuff, if not more, because they're not bound by all of these rules and all these limitations and restrictions and the guilt and the shame and all that stuff. They are like physically, emotionally, intellectually free. I think that's the ticket to liberate people. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have been part of the discussion tonight. I'm just one guy who crawled his way out of religion. I don't have any great wisdom, but I do have a perspective. I do a lot of this. So I'm, I'm involved in a lot of discussions. And I think uh, communication and dialogue is important. I think uh, having discussions about these issues is critical. I think we should be talking often about a lot of stuff. And for the opportunity to be a part of that conversation tonight, I'm deeply grateful. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, uh, Seth, Seth Andrews, for coming. It was a wonderful talk. I imagine that Olivia probably would like to uh, say something. Uh, I will uh, take it over to you. We'll be having a slight after party here uh, where the discussion will continue into the night as usual and the debate, the wonderful, rich, uh, fulfilling debate. I yield the mic now to Lucent or whoever will be emceeing the event. Thank you again, Andrew, and good night. Seth. Olivia may be having some mic uh, issues as she was earlier, uh, in which case I want to uh, deeply thank Seth for coming. I think we all really enjoyed um, engaging with and hearing from you. Um, and I look forward to hearing your podcast, and hopefully we'll hear from you again in the future. So have a great night with your family. Um, and that's <laughs> that's what I wanted to say as well. Uh, thank you, Seth, so much. I enjoyed listening to you, uh, and and I will pay attention in the future. You know, and I and I share your sentiment about community. Um, I am an atheist who goes to church now and then. I sing in the choir. I work in the kitchen. I think it's a it's nice to have a group of people who help one another. Now this little church I go to is not very big. Most of the people there are over 70 years old and probably in the next five years it will be bankrupt. But for now, you know, I, I help when I can. Because I think it's nice for people to help one another. 
I see nothing wrong with that. Now I I sing in the choir. Um, I participate in the service. I, I don't believe a word of it. But you know, I I don't mind. And, and the people that are there know that I am an atheist. I go to Bible study, and we have discussions and debates about the Bible. And, and I, I think in that way, I make a contribution to making people think. And with that, I'll let go of the mic. Seth, thank you so much.